people who will be true to their conscience. So my hypothesis is that from the very beginning, from the time of the Buddha, from the time of the Mahabharata, there has been, you might say, an ideological clash between two views. One view saying revenge, revenge, revenge. The other view saying reconciliation, reconciliation, reconciliation. The world was interested in us and studied us. We ignored the world. And now Indians must study the world in addition to studying India, just to be satisfied by studying our own history and beating the drum about how wonderful that history is, is absolutely insufficient. Hello everyone. Today I bring to you journalist, author, historian, and activist, Rajmohan Gandhi. Rajmohan Gandhi has been a witness to the evolving imagination of India. Since the days his grandfather, Mahatma Gandhi, led the vision for imagination of India. He's also inspired by his maternal grandfather, Chakravarti Rajgopalchari, popularly known as Rajaji. Outside of these two great individuals, he attributes the legacy of his imagination to all the different people he has met through his life and all the histories of the world that he has been curious about. I'm going to focus more today on what he has witnessed, what he has contemplated, and his views on the past, present, and future of India's imagination. So over to Rajmohan Gandhi. Uh, so good morning, and uh, I'm so happy to be talking to you for a variety of reasons. Most of it is to do with you even more than your legacy and because I have observed you, I have been a witness to a lot of things you have done, uh, your interactions with my parents and that history is closer to me than the history of Mahatma Gandhi who I've only heard about through people and books and so on and my curiosity in speaking to you comes from how you have evolved, how your thoughts have evolved and so I do want to use this conversation to understand your thoughts and your experiences and your consciousness as it's evolved. Also because I feel the, the, the ethos of independence struggle and after that, India's last 70 plus years of efforts to evolve into a new society, a free society, is guided by some of the things that happened early on. I can feel it and I don't attribute it to just a few individuals, but to a collective consciousness that has evolved. And from that perspective, I just want to quote Ram Manohar Lohia, who in his uh, work, Economics After Marx, and that is, I'm quoting it from my father's book, Marx and Gandhi. He says, no man's thought should be made the center of a political action. It should help, but not control acceptance and rejection are varying forms of blind worship. I believe that it is silly to be a Gandhian or Marxist, and it is equally so to be anti-Gandhian or anti-Marxist. There are priceless treasures to learn from Gandhi as from Marx, but learning can be done when the frame of reference does not derive from an age or person. The quote closed. I do believe that profound thoughts have life beyond the times in which they were created. And I do want to trace in our conversation the legacy of thoughts that came from that era, some of them from Gandhi, but some of them from the collective wisdom of the team that was built at that time during freedom struggle. And I want to see how the ripple effects have carried forward through the times through you and through the works of the next generation. So that's my curiosity. Good, I'm, I'm delighted with that. And uh, allow me to say this also there, 
that I completely agree with this view that uh, no one who has gone ahead has left thoughts that will guide us for every situation and that uh, we are the beneficiaries, we take advantage of all the amazing human beings before us, not just in our own country, but in the whole world. The best thoughts of the whole world are part of your legacy, part of my legacy. So, and I completely agree with you that we should be free, we should be independent, we should examine everything, we should uh, yeah, examine everything by the touchstones of what is helpful, what is not helpful. And so I wholeheartedly and completely agree with what your father has quoted from Loia, your father's own views. And by the way, I absolutely am delighted that we remember this amazing man, your father, Madhu Dandavate. And I hope we will also remember your amazing mother, Pramila Dandavate. Uh, so I'm I want to start by saying that I completely am in accord with what you have stated just now. Excellent. So my question to you is, if you look at where you are today and your journey, what are those, what is that legacy of thoughts and imagination that uh, carry you forward? Things that have brought meaning to your journey and hope to your imagination. Well, let me add, let me rather begin by saying that I have written several biographies. I have not studied myself as well as maybe I should. So I can't answer your question, uh, you might say in a uh, well-organized, clear, lucid manner, but I can try and say something. Absolutely. And that's the effort of a dialogue. This is not an interview, nor is it an article. Let's just have a spontaneous conversation yeah. because that's my core curiosity in studying people. So, you know, you mentioned science, reason, and innovation as pillars of imagination. I like those ideas. Let me start by saying that I've always been bad at science, bad at innovation. Uh, I hope I have employed reason every now and then, wholeheartedly. But above all, I will say, uh, that, that I've been very lucky. That has been a very important aspect of my life. I've been lucky in my family, my parents, my siblings, and in the wife that I found. I've been lucky in my teammates, in my associates, in my friends. Yes, I've written several books. I've done some journalism. I have this one with me. <laughs> Sorry? I have this book with me right now. And as you can see, I put a lot of post-it notes on that. Okay, good. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> happy to hear that. So, uh, uh, and then I, I should mention my journalism, which is how I started, which is something that I still occasionally continue as a columnist or writing some kind of an op-ed every now and then. Uh, I've also been involved in a work along with others to encourage people to become their greater selves. I've been doing this uh, from the mid 60s or even earlier. And that was at MRA, correct? Yes. And uh, basically, they new, and they have a new name now. Yes, Initiatives of Change. Initiatives of Change. And we have this center in Panchkini at which is where you went to boarding school for many years. And our center there is called Asia Plateau because we always wanted it to be for all of Asia. In fact, we want it for the whole world, uh, not just for India. Uh, and the basic philosophy there is that you can't change the world unless you're also willing to change yourself. Obvious thought, simple thought, uh, but a very useful thought. So we've tried to act on that. So that. So if I look at my life, since you want me to look at my life, you might say my any contribution I might have made. Yes, I've written some books, mostly historical books, some biographies. I've done some journalism, and I've done some work to encourage people to become their greater selves. And uh, so, above all, as I've said, I've been fortunate with family, teammates, associates, friends. So, so uh, I, I was a regular reader of Himmat. 
yeah. when it was being published. I, I as far back, I don't know which year it was founded, but I almost remember it was. Uh, my parents were subscri subscribers of that book, uh, magazine, yeah. and I had my hands on it every time it arrived. Well, I'm very happy to hear that. It was started in '64. But very sadly, it had to close down in 81. So it only lasted for 17 years. But I, I, I know that uh, your, your parents were wonderful supporters of Himmat. And uh, as the word indicates, although the word is a Hindustani word, a Hindi word, an Urdu word, a word used in many Indian languages, Marathi also, but it is uh, not an English word, but our, our journal was in the English language, as of course you, you remember. And uh, this also makes me say that, that right now in the India of today, in the world of today, this idea of Himmat is a very important idea. And uh, that uh, it's, in my mind, the idea of Himmat is connected with the idea also of Ekla Chalo Re. Whatever others may say, whatever whether others support you or not, if you believe in something deeply, be ready to say it. Of course, there are moments in life when one has to be discreet. One can't foolishly shout whatever is on your mind all the time. But there are moments when we have to be ready to say what we believe is the truth, no matter the cost. And as Solzhenitsyn said, one word of truth outweighs the world. Absolutely. And so, uh, while all of us, I hope, uh, are trying to enlist as many people uh, as possible in support of what we feel is right, uh, what is fair, what is just, what is reasonable, uh, ultimately, uh, we don't, we cannot rely on others, even loved ones, even family. Ultimately, it is up to us. Uh, one word of truth is important. So this too, uh, so although I am a very, uh, what shall I say, uh, uh, imperfect in so many different ways, so many ways, I'm not by nature courageous. Uh, I'm certainly by, not by nature innovative or very bright, very smart, but I want always to remember that I have made this commitment and that the world needs people who will be true to their conscience. So I have, I have a question to go back in history. Yeah. You said Himmat was started in 68, right? 64. 64. So soon after China war. Yes. So what was the context in which you came up with the idea of starting the magazine and giving it the name Himmat? Yes, I think you, you're absolutely right. Uh, now, uh, the first issue of Himmat came on October 2 of 64. Uh, Jawaharlal Nehru had died that year, in May of that year. And the first issue had Nehru on the cover. Uh, however, those of us who were involved with Himmat, we did not agree with everything that Nehru said or did. And you mentioned the China War. Uh, so uh, the and at that time, uh, the willingness to uh, criticize Jawaharlal Nehru uh, was not widespread. Uh, today, it is the opposite. <laughs> uh, today, it is very common to debunk him very unfairly. I think that while Nehru, like all human beings, made mistakes, he was an amazing human being, amazing thinker. Uh, and, and his sacrifice, uh, incredible. Uh, very, very great individual in my assessment. But in 64, you're absolutely right. The climate was not in favor of criticizing. Yeah. So that was part of the background, part of, you might say, the reasoning for naming our journal Himmat. We wanted to be ready to criticize uh, the government. And uh, so, uh, and, and uh, uh, yeah, you said which year did it uh, close down? Eighty one. So during emergency, it was still active. Very active. 
and mm-hmm. it it the himmat acquired a new meaning during the emergency yes luckily we live lived up to to, to the name mm-hmm. and we, we opposed the emergency we were penalized because of it in various ways uh, and i am here i must pay my tribute to the wonderful young colleagues that i had of course i had an older wonderful colleague rusi lala uh, who was a remarkable person uh, and who was the active editor i was called the chief editor but i was often here and there and traveling all over the place uh, and rusi played the biggest role in, in running the paper but that his role in ended shortly before the emergency and during the emergency um, two wonderful young women kalpana sharma and nirja chaudhary shouldered uh, the responsibility amazingly and uh, courageously and of course there were others also uh, some young colleagues sanjay hazarika from assam shehnaz akseria from mumbai vijita yapa from sri lanka michael smith from england michael brown from australia uh, i'm now not referring only to the emergency time but even earlier later but uh, just to give an example i given some of these wonderful names of people who made him at what it was uh, vince uh, vijay kumar said who was a great cartoonist uh, was, uh, but anyway this is not the moment to give a history of him but since you ask absolutely uh, and in fact i would like to add to uh, my memory from yeah. my memory is at that time uh the three publications that i regularly read both my parents were in the prison that time yeah. there was a lot of underground literature coming out but there were three oh. publications himmat sadhana edited by yaduna thatte yes and opinion opinion by gorwala by ad gorwala yeah were three publications that stood firm against the onslaught of uh i would call it the dictatorship of the time yes and, and that was something and then of course there was bbc that people were tuning into yeah uh indeed so we were very fortunate uh, to be able to play that role at that time uh so that is uh, the journalistic side but i i since you want to know more about about me i will mention also in relation to my books uh, that mm-hmm. uh now i had no idea that i would do some serious book writing or history writing or biography writing but somehow i was led that way uh and i been mean, there again uh i've been lucky now one of the books i wrote in the mid 80s uh was the life of sardar vallabh bhai patel and luckily uh that book has been uh welcomed it is frequently quoted uh it is available also in hindi and of course in gujarati uh and in english uh, but uh you know when i wrote it in the mid 80s it was published in 1890 uh at that time Sardar Vallabh Bhai Patel uh, was not uh, as popular as greatly honored as he is today uh, and uh, because he is frequently referred to and quoted uh, it is i feel so fortunate that i was able to record his life his utterances his opinions his views on various things uh for instance is the strong way in which he attacked the idea of a hindu raj i was able to now i all that was done in the mid 80s uh, when of course there was no knowledge of what we were going to face and how crucial patel was going to become in, in the years to come so i i mentioned that also as part of my overall statement that my life has been a fortunate one i was fortunate to be able to do this exhaustive and detailed with the help of diaries and vallabhai patel's daughter maniben patel and her diaries and various other documents 
so uh, I, was, I was lucky with that. And, and then I was lucky with my Punjab book. You know, I've written this history of Punjab, which I wrote in 2000, completed and published in 2012. And it's a story of not just our Punjab, but of undivided Punjab. And actually the book is called Punjab, a history from Aurangzeb to Mountbatten. It's a story of 240 years from 1707 when Aurangzeb died, 1947 when Punjab was partitioned, because I wanted to understand the long-term roots of the terrible carnage that took place in 47. And, uh, and, and since I mentioned my good luck, you know, again, my good luck over the Punjab book that the Sikhs have welcomed it, the Hindus have welcomed it. In fact, the, uh, to refer to the going back to the Sikhs, the Guru, De Guru Nanak Dev Ji University in Amritsar gave me a, a delit because of that book. But more interestingly, a great many Muslims in Pakistani Punjab have also welcomed it. And uh, so it has been widely regarded as making an attempt to be as far as possible fair, even-handed, and uh, not take sides. So uh, uh, I'm very uh, grateful that I had this good luck uh, with the Punjab book also. And uh, since uh, you want me to speak about myself and what I've done or not done, so another book I want to mention is a book that was published in 1999. It's called Revenge and Reconciliation, uh, Understanding South Asian History. And it is it has a bold canvas. It starts with the Buddha and the Mahabharata, and it ended with Kargil in 1999. But it looks at South Asian history and largely India's history through the prism of revenge and reconciliation. So my hypothesis is that from the very beginning, from the time of the Buddha, from the time of the Mahabharata, there has been, you might say, an ideological clash between two views. One view saying revenge, revenge, revenge. The other view saying reconciliation, reconciliation, reconciliation. So with that kind of lens, I've looked at India's history and I'm very fortunate again that I was able to compose this book and have it published. So I have a question there. And I think at one point you've talked about uh, Gandhi's uh, emphasis on persuasion versus force as an effective tool for yeah. bringing disparate groups together uh, or winning, I might interpret it as uh, trying to win over an adversary it just occurred to me, so in, as you were talking about reconciliation, because Nelson Mandela created yeah. Reconciliation Commission, yeah. and I would say primarily uh, influenced and inspired by uh, the nonviolence and cooperation and persuasion that Gandhiji talked about. But coming back to your um, a book about Punjab, so my question is in your research. Where do you trace the tension between Hindu and Muslim, looking at it from historic perspective, especially considering that there is now almost like consolidation and recognition that, okay, we are permanent enemies. Now Hindu should just rule and Muslim should just accept a secondary citizenship and subjugate themselves to the majority thinking. I, I don't accept it, but I also want to do a synthesis of where does this come from? Because in any disease that is present in the society, we need to look at its roots and work from there. So in your research, where did you find? Is Does it begin just at partition or does it go back? Uh, so I'll give a couple of uh, attempts to try and answer your important question. Firstly, of course, it goes back a long, 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 very long. Uh, in my understanding, it starts like this. Uh, from the Muslim angle, the Muslim faith was 
supreme. And in their view, uh, the Hindu faith was inferior. That uh, the Hindus, they thought or they claimed that the Hindus were worshipping stones, metal, wood, trees, whereas they were worshipping the Supreme God, the Almighty, the Loving God. So there was a notion that they had a superior belief which they wished to, they wished all of uh, the world and including the people of India also to embrace. So there was this notion of a superior belief. From the Hindu side, there was a notion of superior birth. We are born of a wonderful race. We are born in the sacred land of India. If we are Brahmins, of course, we are very superior. But even if we are not Brahmins, even if we are of other castes, but we are born in India. And you know, uh, this notion of uh, being born in the right place, having the right blood, and regarding others as mlecha, barbarians. Why? Because they were not born like us. So at a very fundamental level, one can think of a clash between this notion of superior belief and the notion of superior birth. That is one very broad way of looking at it. And how far back does it go? Oh, from the very beginning, from the time that uh, Islam first came, and from Basni's time, from Gauri's time. And remember, a very interesting thing, and this continues till today, although it is slightly changing now, finally. We Indians have been completely self-satisfied with what we have, with our belief, with our sense that we, we know so much, that we've done, achieved so much astronomy, mathematics, science, language, drama, poetry, grammar, we can claim some great achievements. And complete disdain, lack of interest in the rest of the world. This to me is a very key point for today. The world was interested in us and studied us we ignored the world. Very interesting. I want to read something which is again in the almost the front of my father's book, Marx and Gandhi. He quotes Mahatma Gandhi, I do not want my house to be walled in on all sides and my windows to be stuffed. I want the cultures of all lands to be blown about my house as freely as possible, but I refuse to be blown off my feet by any. And what I'm hearing is that that was not necessarily the legacy of our history. No, certainly it was not. And, and uh, let, let's face it, let's look at the world today. Now today, and this is how I put it, uh, everybody speaks about the Indian diaspora all over the world, but I put it in a different way. I say that in recent years, uh, Indians have realized that India alone is not their home. The world is the home of the Indian people. The world is the home of the Indian people. So Indians live in America, Indians live in Canada, Indians live in Australia, Indians live in the UK, Indians live in Africa, of course, Indians live in many other places, and of course, they also live in India. The world is the home of the Indian people. However, although the world has become the home of the Indian people, how many Indians have studied the world? Now, for a long, long, long time, Indians have lived in Africa, in all parts of Africa. How many books on Africa have been written by Indians? How many books about South Africa, Kenya, Uganda, Nigeria, which has an immense Indian population? There's no African country which does not have a large Indian population. Scholarly people, teachers, doctors. How many Indians have written about Africa? Indians have lived in the United States now for a very long time, in all parts of I mean, the Indian population of America is considerable now. 2% or what, I don't know, whatever it is. But how many Indians who have lived in the United States have, live, have written about their surroundings, uh, about the people amongst whom they live, about the African Americans, about the Latinos, about the Native Americans, the Indigenous Americans, 
about other Americans. You know, many years ago, I read this book by Vikram Seth. He was traveling from China. He wrote a book called From Heaven Lake, one of his first books. It's a wonderful book. He happened to be in China as a young man, and he traveled all across China and eventually to India in ingenious ways. It's a beautiful book. One of the very first books that I have come across where an Indian writes about China. Now, we always quote the Chinese scholars who came to India, the Greek scholars who came to India, the Arab scholars who came to India, the European scholars who came to India, and we learned about India passed from these scholars who came to India. Many Indian scholars have been to China. Indians took Buddhism to China. But how many Indians have written about China that we are familiar with? So what your father uh, quotes uh, is a very deep conviction that I have, that the world has become the home of the Indian people, and now Indians must study the world, in addition to studying India, just to be satisfied by studying our own history and beating the drum about how wonderful that history is, is absolutely insufficient. So where do you trace the fact that India and India and Indians see world as their home. But when a lot of them I meet around the world still consider their home country to be a Hindu Rashtra. Well, I think that is, uh, yes, they, some of them do. I, by, the, by the way, many don't. Okay. Uh, I, I run into an immense number of people who don't believe that at all, who want uh, not a Hindu Rashtra, but who want uh, uh, India of equality, where everybody has, has, a, has a, a respected and loved uh, place. Um, but, you know, uh, this is a historical thing that we have. Uh, the world may study us, we will not study them, People came from outside, and they also conquered, took over, controlled our country. We didn't study them. We regarded them as inferior, not worth studying. We, we made fun of their language. We made, made fun of their appearance. All this is in history, in, in the records. But they weren't. They were objective. They wanted to study India for their own reasons. Let us study the world. Uh, and, and as you very rightly say, we, we want uh, the world to be our home. Not only do we want the world to be our home, we want equal rights in the world. Rightly so. We want equal rights. We want the chance to become Prime Minister of the UK. Now there's an Indian who's the Prime Minister of the UK. There's a lady who's of Indian origin who's Vice President here. And one day people of Indian origin may become President of the United States. So we want full rights, equal rights all over the world. Terrific. But Muslims who've been in India for a thousand years or more, 1200 years, they will not get equal rights in India. Christians who've been in India for a very long time, they should not get equal rights in India. They will get rights if we choose to give them. So this inconsistency is so glaring so unreasonable. Uh, it, it will not stand uh, the test of time, although it may, you know, we are all human beings who also have a lot of obstinacy and stubbornness and pride. So this may continue for some time uh, in, in some people, but it is bound to run into this reality that we want equal rights in the first generation of our right. Second generation of our right, but we will not give equal rights to people who we, and incidentally, this is another very clear point in my understanding, my writings, and it's a deeply held belief of mine. And of course, Gandhi also shared it, but not because Gandhi had it, or others had it, or Subhash Bose had it, or Nehru had it. That's not, to me, so important. I believe it as a human reality, that every person who lives in India, who is in India, has an absolute right uh, to, to rise to any level, of course, 
to the protection of the state. For anyone to think that only one type of person is to be protected by the police or the army and others have to be somehow not protected. Sometimes as it happens, they, you know, this is the, one of the most uh, painful things about India today, in, in recent years. Some people are accused of carrying cattle, illegal. They are chased, they are murdered, they are lynched. Their relatives go to the police and say, please find the, those who attacked our loved ones. But the police is chasing the alleged cattle traffic people. Not the killers, but those with the victims or relatives of the victims. So uh, the protection is not given to everybody. Uh, and there is some kind of, uh, you know, uh, what are they called? Not minute men, uh, vigilantes, vigilantes. So vigilantes uh, run the show and they push the police to do what they want. And the innocent citizen, or the victimized or targeted citizen, gets neglected. Okay, so I have a question here, a new question. My father was an atheist. For a very long time, I have believed I'm an atheist. And by that, I define is that my intellectual curiosity was focused more on humanity and how humans behave and think and feel rather than on God and religion. But over a period of time, having studied the history of India, politics of India, I've realized that India is a deeply religious country. I'm not saying just Hindu, but every people of every faith. And I also found that Gandhiji recognized this religious core of India. And his politics, his act activism accommodated uh, that the, the core, the religious core, the bhakti core, the spiritual core of India. And he gave it a new flavor through songs like Vaishnava Janato Tene Kaye or, or Raghupati Raghava Raja Ram. He tried to transcend caste differences, religious differences, and turn that into a song of the future. And it still resonates. When you hear those songs, I get goosebumps. I don't think of Gandhi. I just think of this is the ethos I want to embrace. So my question to you is, what is the difference between Gandhi's understanding of the importance of spirituality and religion in Indian life in the context of the future he imagined versus the current dispensations uh, thinking about the role of religion in India? or in Indian politics, in Indian society? Well, you know, that's not a difficult question to answer at all. And the answer contains the line that follows Raghupati Raghav Rajada. Ishwar Allah Tere Na. Sabko Sanmati De Bhagwan. That different people call the Almighty in different names. If a Muslim wants to call God Allah or Khuda, if the Sikh wants to refer to the Wahe Guru, Christians refer to God, uh, Hindus may refer to Shiva or Vishnu or Rama or Krishna, Narayan or any other name that they may wish to give to the Almighty. That uh, That is and the vast majority of Hindus, by the way, the vast majority of Hindus in my interactions, in my study, apart from interacting with people as I travel around, I also have tried to study for my various researches and books. I found that the tolerance and the acceptance that uh, different people may refer to, to the Almighty in different ways, the different religious approaches all lead to the same goal. This is a very deep belief in a great many Hindus also. Uh, and 
yes, there is today this kind of supremacy attitude uh, and uh, some kind of anger at the Muslims, some kind of anger at the Christians, which may have historical reasons, but it is it makes no sense uh, to continue with that today. We all have to live, live together. So uh, you're right that Gandhi understood this, but let me say this from my understanding of Gandhi as a human being, as a historical figure whom I have studied also, that not only did he recognize that the Indian people were deeply religious, deeply spiritual, Indian, that recognition certainly influenced uh, his utterances, his, his approaches to life, but the belief in the Almighty or in the conscience was a very deep personal reality for him. It was not, ah, ah, Indian people are religious, therefore I must use religious language. No, it wasn't quite like that at all. Uh, he was reasonable, he certainly used logic, and as you know, he said again and again and again uh, that anything in the Shastras that is contrary to reason and to morality that he would be willing to reject. That was a categorical statement that he made again and again. Of course, he had these very important uh, debates with Ambedkar, which I think are fascinating. The Ambedkar-Gandhi debate is another very important debate that uh, modern India and future also will should study and, and benefit from. So, uh, can you give just a few highlights for my for our audience? Highlights of what were the areas of differences in that debate between Ambedkar and Gandhi? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, Ambedkar wanted Gandhi to attack the caste system front, which Gandhi for a long time was unwilling to do. Gandhi said, I'm attacking untouchability. It is the greatest evil. And as he said once to Nehru, Nehru also asked Gandhi, why are you not criticizing caste strong enough? So Gandhi said, I'm attacking the weakest element of the orthodox position, the defense of untouchability. If I win this battle, then I will win the bigger battle. But uh, eventually, uh, and I think Ambedkar played a very large role in this, and others also played the role, uh, Gandhi did also directly confront the caste system from the 30s onwards. Uh, and, uh, but for a long time, he did not. And in theoretical terms, you know, when Gandhi tried to say that there was something like there were ashram system which also had equality, where caste was determined not by your birth, but by your aptitude. Uh, but those were not very convincing arguments because Gandhi also always admitted that such an idealized system was not there on the ground. On the ground, there was oppression, there was exploitation, there was discrimination. And Gandhi used very strong words to describe, especially how the Dalits, the untouchables were, being, were treated. But Ambedkar wanted Gandhi to directly attack the caste system, which Gandhi, for political reasons, practical reasons, strategic reasons, was unwilling to do. After all, the caste Hindus were the greatest support to the freedom movement. And he wasn't going to alienate them totally. <laughs> he wanted the caste Hindus also to support him in building bridges with the Muslims. So he had practical necessities of not totally alienating the caste Hindus at every step. These were some of the differences. So Ambedkar was a very intelligent man. He was a primary drafter of the constitution. Did he understand uh, Gandhiji's perspective on this? My understanding is that he did. Of course, he also Incidentally, uh, how did he become the minister, law minister? How did he become the chairman of the drafty committee? Gandhi was involved in that. Nehru was involved in that. Patel was involved in that. And uh, uh, Ambedkar's, uh, one of his first biographers, wonderful uh, Kher Modi, he, he, he relates how Gandhi sent a British friend who, was, who also knew Ambedkar, Muriel Lester, to meet him, to say that Gandhi wants 
Nehru and Patel to include you in the cabinet. Are you willing? And when Muriel Lester reported back to Gandhi that yes, Ambedkar is willing, Nehru and Patel invited him to the cabinet. And incidentally, as some know, but others should know, you may know that in 1944, there was a very important negotiations, Gandhi and Jinnah. They met 14 times in September in Mumbai. Both of them referred to Ambedkar's book on Pakistan during those negotiations. Jinnah using it in this way, Gandhi using it in this way. So Gandhi knew of Ambedkar's very great abilities, scholarly abilities, legal abilities. So there already was, and there, I mean, can you not, what an incredible thing, partition took place, carnage took place, so many people killed, so many people moved. At that time, a Dalit scholar, a magnificent great Dalit scholar, is asked to be the chairman of the drafting committee of the Indian constitution. So, so that was an incredible moment in Indian history. Uh, uh, before Gandhiji's assassination. Uh, and of course, afterwards, there were fresh disputes that Ambedkar had with the Congress party. Uh, there were elections where, he, where the Congress put up somebody else and Ambedkar was defeated once or twice. And that also did not help. And then Ambedkar did, continued to make some very strong statements attacking Gandhi. But in my understanding, uh, there was an amazing coming together and uh, incidentally the uh, the Pune pact uh, of 32 Gandhi Ambedkar which is also a controversial thing but I I've written about it and I will write about it elsewhere also but I won't go into the details of that but the Gandhi Ambedkar story, of course, has lots of clashes, but it has a very deep underlying partnership in it also. So from what you said, I understand that there was partnership for a larger political objective. Gandhi had respect for his capacities and competencies, but I still am curious to hear from you. Did Ambedkar finally see Gandhi's perspective in not making caste a big part of his uh, conversation. May not Did have. You understand his reasoning. No, may not have. No, see, uh, no, at least from what little I've studied of Ambedkar's life, I don't, uh, incidentally, uh, I think Gopal Guru is his name, uh, this uh, important scholar. I think he is now the editor of the EPW. Uh, I believe he has written somewhere that uh, when Gandhi was assassinated, Ambedkar went to Birla house and wept. Uh, so Ambedkar was touched by Gandhi. However, there is no record that I have seen of Ambedkar saying that Gandhi was right in not attacking the caste system. No, that he never said. And nor, nor need anyone say, I mean, Ambedkar felt that if India's society has to find equality, then more and more caste Hindus should have the courage to say that the caste system is wrong. Gandhi always said that hierarchy was wrong. Gandhi said again and again and again that Nobody is low and nobody is high. But that did not satisfy Ambedkar. He wanted Gandhi to say the caste system is wrong. Eventually, Gandhi said that. But I also find, uh, and my question to you is, do you think the followers of Ambedkar today, uh, this tension between Gandhi and Ambedkar, does it get in the way of they entertaining Gandhi's ideas? It may or may not. I, I, by the way, there are many who do. There's a scholar called Nishikant Kolge who's written a wonderful book on Gandhi and caste. Uh, he, uh, I believe he's from a Dalit background and mm -hmm. he's a very fine scholar. 
There are others like that, many others. Uh, so I think uh, I'm sure that more Dalit thinkers will uh, come to understand uh, Gandhi, just as I hope many more uh, Gandhian supporters and uh, Hindus of all kinds will appreciate Ambedkar's uh, thinking. In your view, uh, Ambedkar embracing Buddhism, how did that impact uh, the ethos of India? Uh, yes, that's a very great question. So uh, Ambedkar was saying from the mid thirties or even early thirties that he was not going to die as a Hindu, that he was going to give up uh, Hinduism, but he kept everybody in suspense as to which religion he would accept. And ultimately he chose to accept Buddhism. Um, and, uh, and, I think Dhananjay Kir in his biography of uh, Ambedkar also says that Ambedkar told Gandhi, he does not say when and where, but Ambedkar told Gandhi that he was choosing Buddhism because he wanted to, you might say, uh, shake up Indian society in the least possible manner. So I am not quoting the exact words, but I think what Kir implies is that Ambedkar may have felt that going to Christianity or Sikhism or Islam might have created more tensions than his going to Buddhism might. But I think this is an incomplete answer. I think it's wrong to imply that Ambedkar's choice of religion was a strategic choice or a, some kind of political choice. I think he deeply felt that the Buddha's attitudes uh, against caste uh, and, the Buddhist, and that the Buddha's attitude in favor of the intellect and reason governing human attitudes uh, was a very decisive one. So Ambedkar made a judgment uh, that the element of reason in Buddhism persuaded him to become a Buddhist, but it is likely as, as Kir quotes Ambedkar as saying, that maybe that considerations of tensions in Indian society also weighed with him in choosing Buddhism. So as I taper out of our conversation, I have a few questions that I want to quickly ask. Number one, as much as you have the legacy of Mahatma Gandhi, you also have legacy of Chakravarti Raj Gopalchari. He's not been talked about a lot uh, in public domain, at least in the current conscious, the youth don't have access to information about him. Can you say something about his contribution to India's imagination? Oh, uh, sure. Incidentally, I should add that I've also written his biography. <laughs> and I would say anyone interested uh, is welcome to, I'd be very glad if they, it's called Rajaji, A Life, uh, published by Penguin India, and uh, uh, incidentally, the, I received a Sahitya Academy Award for for, for that that book. But uh, Rajaji was an extraordinary individual, also, and uh, fortunately, there are books by him that people can go to. His translations of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, his translation of the Tamil classic, the Kural. <laughs> And various other uh, books by him uh, are, are quite uh, wonderful resources for any scholar. You know, uh, you say that, uh, yes, I represent uh, Gandhi legacy, Rajaji legacy, all that is true, of course. Uh, that's true for so many other descendants. They all, we all have our ancestors, but let me also say today that as I'm sure you also feel, as you are son of absolutely wonderful parents, and I'm sure there are other ancestors that I, sh I don't know about, but both you and I and everybody else is also an individual in her or his own right. And it is not just Gandhi and uh, Rajaji uh, uh, whose thoughts enter my system. 
the thoughts of all the great thinkers of the world are part of my legacy. Not just within India, but I mean, Dr. Ambedkar is somebody, his thoughts I'm proud of. Nehru, I'm proud of his thoughts. And so many others, but also people in the world. Uh, I belong to the world. I belong to humanity. I'm very proud to be in India, but I belong to the world. These trees uh, that are there behind you in California. Uh, California is part of my world, your world. But so is every part of Asia, every part of Africa. And this is something I, I really, this is a very key, key thought in, in my, uh, today as the world becomes the home of the Indian people, let us as Indian people embrace humanity in reality, not just in words, not by quoting some sentence Vasudev could you know, come over to us. Let us look around. Who are the people around us? Do we study them? Do we know about them? Do we love them? Do we care for them? So my last question to you is, uh, you, and now you, you just talked about your personal journey, not tied to just your legacy. Sitting today, where is your imagination taking you? What's your purpose moving forward? What's your imagination moving forward? Look, at 87, looking forward has some restrictions, you know. Uh, and uh, I, so I don't know whether I have months to live or years to live or days to live or whatever. Uh, and let me interrupt you just once, if you don't mind. Yeah. Dr. Gigi Parikh is 99 and he is still working. What a fantastic person he is. And what a... So he's probably 12 or 13 years older to you. So you still no, have, you still have my... someone to take inspiration from. Absolutely. I, I bow my head before him. And of course, I would love to have some more years if, if I'm given those years. However, I, I, I will say this, that I want, yes, if I'm able to do some serious, additional serious writing, I'll be happy, proud to do if I'm able to contribute to the fight to preserve democracy in India in any way, I will be honored to play that role. Uh, but I also am aware that uh, I must live one day at a time. You know, this is something we learned at, during COVID. All of us learned. Live one day at a time in a very practical way. So that, that is my approach. I will live one day at a time. I'll try to do whatever is useful during that day whether it is in a very limited circle, family circle, or for something deeper, much more fundamental, bigger. Uh, so somebody said, learn as if you will live forever. Live as if, you'll, as if you will die tomorrow. So I must ask one concluding question. Uh, you did say during our last conversation, which is not recorded here, is that your your... I wouldn't, I don't remember the exact words frustrated or upset with the current environment in the country. But my question is, does your heart tell you that this situation can be resolved through fight or persuasion? So incidentally, I'm sure I never said I was frustrated. Okay. I, I was unhappy, I may have said. Okay. I'm really unhappy, I might have said. Okay. I don't feel that I'm frustrated. Okay. I'm deeply disappointed. Sometimes I'm angry too, mm -hmm. but I'm not frustrated. Okay. Uh, I'm deeply concerned, profoundly concerned at the assault on democracy as I see it in India. Uh, but your question is uh, how long it will last or, or... No, my question is, can it be resolved through fight or persuasion? Uh, fight, yes, but not violent fight. Fight in the sense of opposition, dissent, disagreement, protest, nonviolent fight accompanied by persuasion. Uh, we have to also to say, we have to learn to say no. And we have to say, come, let us discuss. That's wonderful. This is 
Uh, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I learned a lot. Well, you are doing something very uh, valuable and very unexpected and very fresh, Uday, and you have every good wish from me. <laughs>